Beneath the flowing Cornish sky, in Enadoc's snug arms I lie. At rest below the trampled grass, where pentax bearing trippers pass, and as this simple stone they see, say, Betjeman, now who was he? Our Betjeman, now he did well with all that verse he used to sell. But one or two have come to pay their kind respects and gravely say, God dressed his dormant soul in heaven. He scored a decent 77. Come on, come on. This hillock hides the spire. Now that one and now none. As winds about the burnished path through ladies' finger, time and bright varieties of saxifrage, so grows the tinny tenor faint or loud, and all things draw towards St. Enadoc. We start our journey in search of Betjeman's Britain by following this well-worn path across the fairway of one of the most enjoyable golf courses I know, a path the poet must have trod many hundreds of times. It leads to a place that was and is very special to him. Much of the popular appeal of Betjeman's poetry was due to his keen interest in places, towns, villages and buildings, especially churches. At the end of this path, behind this high tamarisk hedge, we will find the strange little Cornish church of St. Enadoc. And this is where John Betjeman is buried in the same graveyard as his mother, who lies just over there. At first, there was a simple wooden cross to mark his grave. That was replaced by this equally simple headstone made of local Danibold slate. Betjeman loved to find the unusual, and St. Enadoc rates high in that category. The church was certainly here long before the golf course, but for years it was buried up to the eastern gable under gale-blown sand. It was rescued in 1864 by the Reverend Hart Smith. Every summer, lured by the seaside golf and the fishing, Betjeman's father would bring his family down to Trebetherick. Down this typically moist Cornish lane, he eventually built a fine holiday home. Nearby, in later years, John Betjeman bought his own house, Treen, where he was to spend many restful and enjoyable vacations and where he passed his last reflected days. On the lane goes, past the footpath to St. Enadoc Church, and then on down to Dama Bay, past the fierce guard dogs and to the pleasures of holidaying past and present. And oh, the excitement of that first step onto the wide, damp sands. Sand in the sandwiches, wasps in the tea, sun on our bathing dresses heavy with the wet, squelch of the bladder rack, waiting for the sea, fleas round the tamarisk, an early cigarette. Then, before breakfast, down towards the sea, I ran alone, monarch of miles of sand its shining stretches, satin-smooth and veined. I felt beneath bare feet the lugworm casts and walked where only gulls and oyster-catchers had stepped before me to the water's edge. We came round Grenaway to the next bay, glorious Polzeth, 
on the sort of morning that Cornwall all too frequently lays on for us. The tide, sending, exploring ripple upon ripple down Polzeth shore, was meeting a positive tide of rainwater coming the other way. In First and Last Loves, published by John Murray in 1952, there is a collection of early prose pieces, many of them vivid descriptions of places he especially enjoyed, some of them first discovered during these childhood holidays. There is a section called Three Churches, obviously three special favourites, one of them discovered on boyhood bicycle rides in a remote village on the fringes of Bodmin Moor. Of all the country churches of the West I have seen, I think the church of St. Protus and St. Hyacinth, Blisland in Cornwall, is the most beautiful. I was a boy when I first saw it, 30 or more years ago. I shall never forget that first visit, bicycling to the inland and unvisited parts of Cornwall from my home by the sea. Perched on the hill above the wood stands Blisland village. It has not one ugly building in it. And, which is unusual in Cornwall, the houses are round a green, between the lichen-crested trunks of elm and ash that grow on the green, you can see everywhere the beautiful moorland granite. That first thrill of turning the handle of the door of a church never seen before, or a church dearly loved and visited again and again like Brisland, who but the confirmed church crawler knows it? Saninian Compa, that great church architect, says that a church should bring you to your knees when first you enter it. Such a church is Blisland. The screen, the glory of the church, the golden altars, the stained glass and the pulpit are comparatively new, designed by F.C. Eden in 1897. What do dates and style matter in Blisland Church? There is Norman work in it, and there is 15th and 16th century work, and there is sensitive and beautiful modern work. But chiefly it is a living church whose beauty makes you gasp, whose silent peace brings you to your knees, even if you kneel on the hard stone and slate of the floor, worn smooth by generations of worshippers. St. Protus and St. Hyacinth, patron saints of Blisland Church, pray for me. Often in a bus or train, I call to mind your lovely church, the stillness of that Cornish valley, and the first really beautiful work of man which my boyhood vividly remembers. One of the greatest adventures during the holidays was to take the long and bracing walk down the sands from Damer Bay to Rock, there to clamber aboard the ferry across the Camel Estuary to Padstow. The approach to Padstow I like most of all is the one I've made ever since I was a child. It is by ferry from the other side of the estuary. It was best in a bit of a sea with a stiff breeze against an incoming tide, puffs of white foam bursting up below the great head of distant Pentire and round the unapproachable cliffs of the rocky island of Newland. We would dip our hands in the water and pretend to feel seasick with each heave of the boat. And then the town would spread out before us, its slate roofs climbing up the hillside from the wooden wharves of the harbour till they reached the old church tower and the semicircle of wind-slashed elms which run as a dark belt right around the top of the town, as though to strap the town in more securely still against those southwest gales. Slate-hung houses are built in a semicircle round the harbour. Here and there, the silver-blue tile buildings are diversified by an old rose-coloured brick house. And near me is a building called the Abbey House, with granite 15th-century coins. The main streets are, thank goodness, little altered. There's not much grand architecture in Padstow. It is all humble, unobtrusive houses three storeys high. Yet, as soon as one of them is taken down, the look of the town suffers. 
and at the top of the hill, the fine church of St. Petrock, made of brown and grey Cornish slate. Sometimes we would return on a fine, still evening, laden with a week's shopping, and see that familiar view lessen away from the ferry boat, while the Padstow bells, always well rung, would pour their music across the water. John Betjeman was born in North London in 1906 at 52 Parliament Hill Mansions on the fringes of Kentish Town and Gospel Oak. His own real memories begin at 31 Highgate West Hill, where the family soon moved as his father's business prospered. In the poem Parliament Hill Fields, he vividly remembers the journeys back from shopping expeditions aboard the ever-romantic tram. Launched aboard the shopping basket, sat precipitately down, rocked past Fonziger's, the Baker's, and the terrace blackish brown, and the curious Anglo-Norman parish church of Kentish Town, till the tram went over thirty, sighting terminus again, past municipal lawn tennis and the bobble hanging plain. Soft the light suburban evening caught our ashlar speckled spire, 1860 early English as the mighty elms retire. They would alight at the foot of West Hill, where the old ironmonger's shop still stands, and walk on past St Anne's Church, where he was baptised, and where the family regularly went on Sundays. And then on up the hill, and home to number 31. Each morning he would set off unwillingly to school, climbing the ever-steepening hill, till he passed the parish church of St Michael and then the grand gates of the old house, the equally old and hospitable flask, in later life the delight of many a pleasant summer evening. Past the grand houses of the grove, where once Mr Coleridge, the poet, used to dwell, and many other distinguished people since. And along to number seven, where, after a party, he heard a grand lady say, I wonder where Julia found that strange, rather common little boy. At first he went to a prep school, long disappeared, then to Highgate Junior School, where a kindly American poet called Mr. T.S. Eliot taught English. And so I bound my verse into a book, The Best of Betchman, and handed it to one who, I was told, liked poetry, the American master, Mr. Eliot. That dear good man with proof rock in his head and Sweeney waiting to be agonised, I wonder what he thought. Highgate, now firmly attached to and surrounded by North London, is still a real village with excellent pubs and a good bookshop and many secluded villas, such as the one where A. Houseman rather surprisingly wrote A Shropshire Lad. And, most deservedly, a splendidly named Literary and Scientific Institute, where a fine collection of Betjeman's books is being gathered together. And in the holidays, back to St. Enadoc and Damer Bay. Blessed be St. Anadoc, blessed be the wave, blessed be the springy turf, we pray, pray to thee, ask for our children all the happy days you gave to Ralph, Basie, Alistair, Biddy, John and me. During these holidays, the Betjemans became friendly with the Lynan family, who had a home nearby. While near the ninth green at St. Enadoc, we oh, met up with Mr. Lynan. Harry Champion. Do you want anything? Any relation to the other Harry Champion? Any old iron? <laughs> no, not no. He remembered both Betjeman and his boyhood friend, Jock Lynan. That's right. Well, they lived, Jock Lynan lived just below where Betjeman lived, of course. You go straight across the course here by the church, you come to a path and you come out on the road to Trebetherick, you'll see a house called Clickbank, and that was where Jock Lynham lived, of course. But Jock Lynham, from Dragon School, Oxford, was all for the locals, you see. 
They bring a team down, a schoolmaster, very fine cricketers too. I mean, a marvellous man. Jock's father, A. E. Lynan, was then a senior master and later headmaster at the Dragon School in Oxford, and it was arranged that John should become a pupil there. From the school, he made his first excursions into Oxford and discovered the strange church of St. Barnabas in that part of Oxford designated Jericho. He thought St. Barnabas a bit of an architectural imposition with its polychromatical lacing of bricks. He much preferred the isolated beauty of Ifley, a perfect Cotswold-type village now surrounded by industrial South Oxford. You come to it and its beautiful Norman church like entering another world. St. Mary the Virgin, Ifley, a late Norman showpiece, and rightly so, within and without. West front rich in beakhead and zigzag carving. After the Dragon School, to the harsh routines of Marlborough. We won't dwell on the buildings that caused him so much anguish, but wander off, as he must have done so many times, to the busy little market town, with its main street said to be one of the widest in the country. Marlborough has done its best to remain quaint, and buildings have been done in all manner of styles. I wonder what they're cooking up under that scaffolding over there. Well, you don't have to go far from Marlborough to find the second country church of the three that he specially chose in first and last loves. It's in the little village of Milden Hall. Now, what you found is Minor Church. Uh, Milden Hall is its postal address, I suppose, but we, it is always called Minor locally. Uh, we don't like to be muddled up with the Milden Hall in Suffolk. Of all the churches which remain almost untouched by the Victorians, the loveliest I know is Minel near Marlborough. It stands in the Kennet Water Meadows, a simple four-square affair, three-storied tower, nave, aisles either side and a chancel. But as you approach it, there are signs of the past. Clear glass panes, patched and flaking outside walls looking like an old watercolour. And then the inside. You walk into the church of a Jane Austen novel, into a forest of magnificent oak joinery, an ocean of box pews stretching shoulder high all over the church. Each is carved with decorations in a Strawberry Hill Gothic manner. Minel is a patriarchal country church. It is the embodiment of the Church of England by law established, the still heart of England as haunting to my memory as the tinkle of sheep bells on the Wiltshire Downs. It was through a friend from Marlborough, who kindly invited him home for weekends, that he first discovered Dorset. And he seems to have been fascinated by the county's preference for keeping its place names in their old Saxon form. Rhyme Intrinsica, Fontmel Magna, Sturminster Newton and Melbury Barb. Whist upon whist upon whist upon whist drive in institute, region and social club. Horny hands that hold the aces which this morning held the plough. While Tranter Reuben, T.S. Eliot, H.G. Wells and Edith Sitwell lie in Melstock churchyard now. Lord's Day bells from Bingham's Malcolm, Iwan Minster, Shroton, Clough. Down the grass between the beeches, mellow in the evening hush. Gloved the hands that hold the hymn book which this morning milked the cow, while Tranter Reuben, Mary Borden, Brian Howard, and Harold Acton lie in Melstock churchyard now. Lights abode, celestial Salem, lamps of evening smelling strong, gleaming on the pitch pine, waiting, almost empty, even song. From the aisles, each window smiles on grave and grass and yew tree bough, while Tranter Reuben, Gordon Selfridge, Edna Best and Thomas Hardy lie in Melstock churchyard now. Those verses were a parody of a poem by Thomas Hardy, and Melstock is, in real life, Stinsford, in whose graveyard the heart of Thomas Hardy is buried. 
The regular holidays continued in Cornwall, but John also used to be taken on men-only shooting, boating and fishing trips to Norfolk. His father had a boat moored at Coltishall. There, after supper, lit by lantern light, warm in the cabin I could lie secure, and hear against the polished sides at night the lap-lap lapping of the weedy bill, the whispering and watery Norfolk sound, telling of all the moonlit reeds around. From there, trips were made to the broads and the coast and places like reedy Horsey Mere. Oh, when the early morning at the seaside took us with hurrying steps from Horsey Mere to see the whistling bent grass on the lee side and then the tumbled breaker line appear on high the clouds, with mighty adumbration, sailed over us to seaward, fast and clear. There splashed about our ankles as we waded, those intersecting wavelets morning cold. And sudden dark, a patch of sea was shaded, and sudden light, another patch would hold the warmth of whirling atoms in a sun shot, and underwater sandstorm green and gold. How cold the bathe! How chattering cold the drying, how welcoming the inland reeds appear, the wood smoke and the breakfast and the frying, and your warm fresh water ripples pausing near. At last the time came to go to Oxford as an undergraduate, a chance to explore its architectural splendours. He became a member of Magdalen College, and at first he lived in rooms here, in the new buildings. We were fortunate to arrive in Oxford on finals day and enjoy to the full its budding scholars and full regalia and full traditional cry. One very special friendship he made was with the brilliant young scholar C. M. Bara, who did much to encourage his talent. How many times in later years he must have gone through these gates and turned this corner to this door, where Morris Bara afterwards presided as the noted warden of Wadham College. Bara said of the poet, Dutchman has a mind of extraordinary originality. There is no one else remotely like him. In 1938, Betjeman rewarded Oxford by a beautifully produced, if somewhat quirkish, review of its splendours under the name of an Oxford University chest. By 1931, Betjeman had published his first book of poems, Mount Zion. The title page pays homage to a gracious hostess and a magnificently gracious if strange house called Seasingcoat near Morton in Marsh. Oxford May mornings. When the pruners bloomed, we'd drive to Sunday lunch at Seasingcoat. First steps in learning how to be a guest, first wood smoke scented luxury of life in the large ambiance of a country house. Home of the oaks, exotic Seasingcoat. Stately and strange it stood the Nabob's house, Indian without and coolest Greek within. From the splendour of Seasingcote to the squalor of North London, Betjeman was a native of Highgate, but his parents had spent their early married days in Highbury, and there we ventured to find two contrastingly fated holy relics. On roaring iron down the Holloway Road, the red trams and the brown trams pour, and little, each yellow-faced, jolted load, knows of the fast-shut, grained oak door. Away from the barks and the shouts and the greetings, psalm singing over and love lunch done, listening to the Bible in their room for meetings, old Sandemanians are hidden from the sun. The Sandemanian meeting house is sad and neglected, 
but the Church of St. Saviour's in Aberdeen Park, though no longer used as a church, has found a worthy new role. For over the waste of willow herb, look at her, sailing clear, a great Victorian church, tall, unbroken and bright, in a sun that's setting in Wilsdon and saturating us here. Great red church of my parents, cruciform crossing they knew. Over these same encaustics they and their parents trod, bound through a red brick transept for a once familiar pew, where the organ set them singing and the sermon let them nod. And up this coloured brickwork the same long shadows grew as these in the stenciled chancel where I kneel in the presence of God. And now what do we find? A flourishing centre for up-and-coming artists, here preparing for an exhibition. The Florence Trust, which runs the church, deserves all the encouragement we can give it. After Betjeman's marriage to Penelope Chetwode in 1933, family life led him to an area of England that was to become another basic centre for his thoughts and his poetry the Vale of the White Horse, Oxfordshire and Berkshire running on into Wiltshire. Their first home was at Garrard's Farm in the scattered little village of Uffington. Uffington is rightly proud of an almost cathedral-like early English church with a very impressive octagonal tower. Tonight we feel the muffled peal hang on the village like a pall. It overwhelms the towering elms that death-reminding dying fall. The very sky, no longer high, comes down within the reach of all. Imprisoned in a cage of sound, even the trivial seems profound. From here, there were visits to the home of Lord Berners in Farringdon. A year or two ago, Lord Berners wanted to build a tower on a tree-clad eminence known as Farringdon Folly in Berkshire. The local council objected to the erection of the tower on ascetic grounds. Of course, when the case reached the Ministry of Health, which for some mysterious reason is the arbiter of public taste in these matters, the objections of the council were overruled and Lord Berners was allowed to build his tower. The next move was to the picturesque old rectory at Farnborough, and thence to the collective folly of Wantage. Wantage is one of those towns that seems to have been swamped by commerce and the motor car. But maybe there is more to it than meets the eye, and it certainly seemed to inspire the poet. And it has its charming corners, like the Mead, their next home, immortalised on the cover of his collected poems. Penelope ran a waterfowl farm from here, and in Wantage itself, the Betjemans jointly ran a cake shop and cafe with the cashing-in name of King Alfred's Kitchen. It now serves a rather more international cause. It was with real regret that he finally bid farewell to this besieged town. From this wide vale, where all our married lives we too have lived, we now a world away, momently clinging to the things we knew, friends, footpaths, hedges, house and animals, till borne along like twigs and bits of straw, we sink below the sliding stream of time. In 1945, he had published a collection of poems under the title of New Bats in Old Belfries. It included poems on St Barnabas, Bath, East Anglia, and he made a first visit to Henley-on-Thames, that delightful, if busy, Thames-side spot, with a brewery that brews some of the best beer in Britain. I see the winding water make a short and then a shorter lake, as here stand I and houseboat high survey the upper Thames. By sun the mud is amber dyed, in ripples slow and flat and wide that flap against the houseboat side and flop away in gems. 
in mud and elder scented shade a reach away the breach is made by dive and shout that circles out to henley tower and town and boats for hire the rafters ring and pink on white the roses cling and red the bright geraniums swing in baskets dangling down. When shall I see the Thames again, the prow promoted gems again, as beefy hats without their hats come shooting through the bridge, and cheerio and cheery by across the waste of waters die, and lo the mists of evening lie, and lightly skims the midge. From the riverside to the seaside, in a very British memory of Frontline Margate in 1940. I wonder how much it's changed since then. They don't seem to wear quite so much nowadays. But the posh Cliftonville end is probably very much the same as it was. And here we are at what they used to call Queen's High Cliff, though they don't seem to call it that anymore. And beyond, you can see a little bit of the cliff, not very high, I'm afraid. And beyond that, a little bit of the old pier in a very sorry state nowadays. And then if you look over on the left at this rather handsome block of flats, um, that is where the old Queen's Hotel used to be, but long disappeared and replaced by these buildings. From out the Queen's high cliff for weeks at a stretch, I watched how the mower evaded the vetch, so that over the putting course rashes were seen of pink and of yellow among the burnt green. How restful to putt when the strains of a band announced a Te Donsor was on of the grand, while over the privet, cunningly clear, I heard lesser co-optimists down by the pier. How lightly municipal, meltingly tarred, were the walks through the laws by the Queen's promenade, a soft over Cliftonville languished the light down Harold Road, Norfolk Road, into the night. From third floor and fourth floor the children looked down upon ribbons of light in the salt-scented town, and drowning the trams roared the sound of the sea as it washed in the shingle the scraps of their tea. Betjeman ends his poem. Beside the Queen's high cliff, now rank grows the vetch. And I must say that the vetch still looks pretty rank. And remember, this is an evening in 1940 when he finished his poem. Now dark is the terrace, a storm-battered stretch. And I think, as the fairy lit sights I recall, it is those we are fighting for, foremost of all. We've already dipped into first and last loves and found there the section devoted to three favourite churches. And we've already visited Blisland and Meinl. The third, surprisingly, was in Industrial Swindon. Betjeman explained his choice thus. If ever I feel England is pagan and that the poor old Church of England is tottering to its grave, I revisit St Mark Swindon. That corrects the impression at once. A simple and definite faith is taught. St. Mark's and its daughter churches are crowded. Swindon, so ugly to look at to the eyes of the architectural student, glows golden as the new Jerusalem to eyes that look beyond the brick and stone. The church crawler starts by liking old churches, but he ends by liking all churches. And of all churches, those that are most alive are often those hard-looking buildings founded by Victorian piety, churches like St. Mark's Swindon. We also visited Christchurch in Swindon. Your peal of ten ring over then this town, ring on my men, nor ever ring them down. 
this winter chill. Let sunset spill cold fire on Billard Hill and on Sir Gilbert's spire. So new, so high, so pure, so broached, so tall. Long run the thunder of the bells through all. Oh, still white headstones on these fields of sound, hear you the wedding joy bells wheeling round. Oh, brick-built breeding boxes and new souls, hear how the peeling through the louvers rolls. Naturally, many pieces on Cornwall find a place in first and last loves. And taking us pleasantly back to its north coast, there is a glowing piece on Fort Isaac. Not until you round a corner do you see any sign of Port Isaac at all. Then you see it all, huddled in a steep valley, a cover at the end of a coombe, roofs and roofs tumbling down either steep hillside in a race for shelter from the southwest gales. Port Isaac is Polpero without the self-consciousness, St Ives without the artists. Port Isaac has no grand architecture. A simple slate Methodist chapel and Sunday school in the Georgian tradition hangs over the harbour and is the prettiest building in the town. On the opposite side of the water is a picturesque Gothic style school from whose pointed windows the teachers could, if they wished, pitch their pupils down the cliffside into the harbour below. It is the kind of place town planners hate, the quintessence of the quaint. There are no boulevards, no car stands or clinics, the dentist calls once a week and brings his instruments with him in his car. The trade of Port Isaac really is fishing. The harbour does not draw much water. It hardly is a harbour. A better description will be an unexpected cove between high cliffs. Two arms have been built out into the water to keep back the bigger seas, while great guardian headlands keep the harbour calm in most weathers. So far, we have not ventured onto Cornwall's southern coast, where, avoiding the ravages of the mining industry, you will find such magical spots as Foy and Lou. We found the latter on a rather blustery day and found a local ferryman to help us prove Betjeman's assertion that Lou is best seen from a boat. When I first came into Lou by road, I was disappointed. I could hardly see the two old towns and the long Victorian stone bridge which joins them. I could hardly see the houses for motor cars. Loo is two towns, East Loo and West Loo, one on each side of a steep valley. In East Loo, the bigger and more prosperous of the two old towns, the old streets are along the quaysides. In West Loo, the prettier and less visited town, old houses climb a hill from an octagonal market house, now a grocer's shop. It is quite easy to see how these two places grew just from looking at the villages. And the best way to see them is not by road, but by water. Where was the old market house? You mentioned an octagonal market house. Was that, the, that place there? Yeah, that would be the market. Right. The only Johnny Sailor. Oh, behind it. Yeah. You can't see it. From there. As I put out, the noise fell away. There were just the chug-chug of an outboard engine, the wail of gulls, the old and silvery wharves of Lou slipping past us. We turned the boat round and slid fast with the tide back along the quays. All up the cliffs above the town were perched the boarding houses, Plymouth style, in grey cement or cream, drain pipes and bay window frames painted green, the name of the boarding house writ large on a board above the second floor windows. Most houses have a view above the old towns and out to cliffs and open sea. This is the band joke here. here. And here we were, sliding past the Banjo Pier and the tiny sand beach behind it, and out to open sea ourselves.
Betjeman's great interest in churches was not merely self-indulgent. He did a lot to make us aware of our church legacy, and he also helped to save and preserve much of it. The Redundant Churches Fund does a wonderful job and deserves all the support we can give it. Without them, we should no longer be able to enjoy such treasures as St. Catherine's at Chiselhampton. He wrote a poem on its behalf in 1952. Across the wet November night, the church is bright with candlelight and waiting evensong. A single bell with plaintive strokes pleads louder than the stirring oaks, the leafless lanes along. How warm the many candles shine on Samuel Dalbigan's design for this interior neat. These high box pews of Georgian days, which screen us from the public gaze when we make answer meet. How gracefully their shadow falls on bold pilasters down the walls and on the pulpit high. The chandeliers would twinkle gold as pre-Tractarian sermons rolled, doctrinal, sound and dry. From that west gallery, no doubt, the violent serpent tooted out the talus tune to Ken. And firmly at the end of prayers, the clerk below the pulpit stairs would thunder out, Amen. But every wandering thought will cease before the noble altarpiece with carven swags arrayed, for there in letters all may read the Lord's commandments, prayer and creed, and decently displayed. And must that plaintive bell in vain plead loud along the dripping lane? And must the building fall? Not while we love the church and live, and of our charity will give our much, our more, our all. For a year or two, in the 1950s, Betjeman contributed a weekly column to The Spectator under the title of City and Suburban. For it, he travelled all over Britain and the pieces are a rich source of topographical lore. He especially enjoyed the old journalistic ploy of the best of game. And with one choice, the prettiest village in England, we have no complaint. Ashwell in hearts, quietly tucked away off the Royston to Balderstock Road, is still a real gem. We first saw its gigantic dark grey 14th century church tower, crowned with a tapering lead flesh, rising from huge elms on chalky foothills, looking over open cornland to the levels of hunts and cairns. The main street to the village wound with varying vistas of colour washed cottages white and orange and pink, half-timbered and grey-green local 19th century brick. There were lanes lined by thatched walls leading to the wooden mill and Puritan chapels and to a big house built by Lutyens. Lutyens didn't actually build the house but only modified it. The old mill has been modernised and the church's added steeple is really not big enough for the tower it surmounts, as well as being slightly crooked. But we fell in love with Ashwell, as he did. In The Spectator for March the 16th, 1956, Betjeman wrote, The nearest untouched Surrey village to London is Thorpe, near Egham. It is a place of very old brick walls, tall trees, and has six ancient buildings listed by the Ministry of Works. Betjeman was protesting about modern developments involving the felling of trees and making gaps in old walls. It is most extraordinary how almost every despoliation of English landscape today is due to the activities of local councils. I suppose at that time the village would have amounted to about 250, 300 people and now is probably nearer 2,000 people. So the biggest difference of all would be an enormous amount of extra housing. Uh, and with that, I suppose the next greatest difference would have been the arrival of the dreaded motorways, which have sliced the community and the village in half. Does anyone, apart from its residents, remember what a sensation the idea of Bedford Park was, a garden suburb for the middle classes? I wish I were a director, or at any rate an influential employee of the firm of Pat Max, who own, among other attractive premises, the Tabard Inn, Bedford Park, Chiswick. 
There it stands among the delightful houses of that earliest experiment in suburban planning for artistic people with moderate incomes. Many an old art worker of the William Morris tradition lived here, beating opals into pewter or painting sunflowers on panelling or weaving homespuns. Here the youthful Yeats lived when he first came to London, and in the noble room above the tabard, panelled in cedar wood from a city church, no doubt artistic people from the suburb listened to William Morris lecturing or to ladies playing the clavichord. The Tabard Inn was designed by the great Norman Shaw, and the walls of its public bar are lined with tiles by William de Morgan. It was all of a splendid piece, conceived by the great architect Norman Shaw. Houses, pubs and church planned alike. What an inspiring place to live in. In the Saturday book for 1958, Betjeman compiled an illustrated list of some of his favourite architectural delights under the title of Betjeman's Britain. Alongside the Tabard Inn and several favourite railway stations, he found a pleasing bit of domestic elegance, Pennsylvania Park in Exeter. It was well worth negotiating Exeter's ring roads to find this fine terrace. Almost a twin is to be found in Sidmouth, earlier extolled in first and last loves. I doubt if anywhere on the south coast there is a prettier Georgian stucco crescent than Fortfield Terrace, which overlooks the cricket ground and sea. Betjeman added his support to many campaigns against schemes which threatened, for good or bad reasons, to despoil or destroy things and places which he valued. In 1967, in order to save the British countryside, he joined those who were protesting against the expansion of Stansted Airport, and he contributed an introduction to this book. By Heathrow standards, Stansted looks like a stall at a village fate, but it's definitely a blot on the landscape. Fearsome diagrams in the Stansted book promised a living hell for all those in airshot. Was this to be the lasting result of the airport's subsequent expansion? Houses, cottages, farms, all lying empty and derelict. The living wisely fled. This is a map showing where they thought all the the trouble would be from the airport. It would be interesting to go up to uh, Chickney here, and Finching Field and Thaxstead to see how they've been affected. There's Finching Field as it was. Chickney with the navigation flares. Seeking out some of the illustrations in the book, we spoke to the gentleman who lived in the house under the navigation flares at Chickney. No, he hardly noticed the planes. So we drove toward Thaxted, shimmering and magical in the distance. And it still seemed a quietly picturesque place, full of living people, the retreat of Dick Turpin in this fine, full-timbered house. And here we found the home of the famous composer, Gustav Holst. We asked the people in the street if they were worried by aeroplanes. Not on the whole, it seemed, but we ought to be there on a Wednesday, when the Russian plane came over. On to Finching Field, where the village green, the duck pond and the ducks seem much the same as in the photograph in the book. We never even heard an aeroplane. But there's now a threat of another runway and bigger planes and more and more people want to travel, so someone must pay the price. We'll end this stage of our journeying back in Cornwall. Firstly, to visit the clubhouse at St. Enadoc. In the reception is Betjeman's tribute to a much-loved secretary of this friendly club. The flag that hung half-mast today seemed animate with being, 
as if it knew for whom it flew and will no more be seeing. He loved each corner of the links, the stream of the eleventh, the grey-green bents, the pale sea pinks, the prospect from the seventh. To the ninth tee, the uphill climb, a grass and sandy stairway, and at the top, the scent of thyme and long extent of fairway. He knew how on a summer day the sea's deep blue grew deeper, how evening shadows over Bray made that round hill look steeper. The Times would never have the space for Ned's discreet achievements. The public prints are not the place for intimate bereavements. A gentle guest, a willing host, affection deeply planted. It's strange that those we miss the most are those we take for granted. Thence to Wadebridge. In Betjeman's childhood, Wadebridge Station would have been a busy place. But by the end of his life, it was no longer so. Can it really be that this same carriage came from Waterloo? On Wadebridge Station, what a breath of sea scented the Camel Valley. Cornish air, soft Cornish rains, and silence after steam. But now, delightfully, it is once again well used and appropriately named. There, I spoke to Dr. Kinsman Barker, who was Betjeman's GP. After he died, it occurred to me that as he loved stations, and our station was derelict, and would probably be pulled out and turned into a Tesco, it, it might be an idea to renovate it. And as I'd always been interested in providing an activity center for the retired to delay senescence and to provide for those who are older still, that if we were to restore the station and provide a memorabilia room uh, in the memory of Betjeman and his life, we could probably manage to convert the station and have a beautiful center for the retired. And in actual fact, we raised 300,000 pounds two-thirds of it being from the friends of Betjeman. <laughs> Many of these things came from his house, Treen. His desk, his writing things, letters, books, pictures. And there on the wall is the cross that originally marked his grave at St. Enadoc. I lie now nearer to the green than with most shots I'd ever been. And on a dry and running day, showers of golf balls come my way, descending not from source divine, but from an ill-struck number nine. While echoing down to Damer's shore, I hear the distant cry of four. I slumber in these hallowed grounds, contented to be out of bounds. <laughs> 